been three years since the Occupy Central movement in Hong Kong. The movement led to 955 individuals arrested and more than 300 activists and police officers hurt. The impact of the incident can still be felt today in Hong Kong and on the Chinese mainland. On Monday, the new leader of the State Council's Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office in Beijing, Zhang Xiaomin, and the director of the central government's liaison office in Hong Kong, Wang Zhiming, were sworn in. The two officials clarified that one country, two systems remains the leading principle and there will be no change in that direction. So, three years on since the end, since the start of the movement, what lessons have been drawn and what needs to be done better to bridge the divide in Hong Kong society? Welcome to The Point. I'm Li Xin, and joining me today for the discussion from Beijing is Henry Ho, convener of the One Country, Two Systems Youth Forum and in Hong Kong by Andrew Leong, an international and independent China strategist. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Mr. Leong, let me ask you first. Thank you. Now, regarding the latest personnel change that I mentioned, there's been some speculation that it signals uh, a change in Beijing's Hong Kong policy. Do you see it that way? Well, not at all, because um, and the, the, the same personalities are there, only that there is a change in positions. So I don't think, and also the one country, two system principle, uh, right from the start, uh, underpins uh, Hong Kong's special uh, system and that system is of ben uh, beneficial to the people of Hong Kong and also beneficial to the country. Um, and so I don't think that these uh, personality changes um, mean anything to to uh, any difference uh, in in this policy. Mm -hmm. Harry, now uh, Zhang Xiaoming has become the director of the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office under the State Council in Beijing. Uh, it is regarded by some as a sign of approval by the central government of his work in the territory. However, some people in Hong Kong said they were surprised by this transfer. What's your thoughts on this change? Uh, Mr. Zhang has worked in Hong Kong for about five years. I think he has worked very hard and uh, because we have all seen many challenges in the past five years including the occupation central movement, mm -hmm. uh, the political reforms, etc. I think he has done well and implemented the central government's Hong Kong policy mm -hmm. pretty well. And, uh, as, and he's also very experienced in, in, in this matter yeah. as he, was, he has been in the Hong Kong and Macau uh, office you know, for more than 20 years before transferring to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Andrew, uh, another uh, pa character we are seeing coming in to a brighter spotlight maybe is the new director of the central government's liaison office in Hong Kong, Mr. Wang Zhiming. Uh, how do you think his presence will affect the political climate in Hong Kong in the near future? Well, I think that um, Mr. Wang also has been uh, in Hong Kong um, uh, in um, dealing with the, the, the one country, two systems for a long, long time. He, he's an old hand, an old, old Hong Kong hand. But of course the personalities um, are different. Um, Mr. Zhang and Mr. Wong, uh, they are, they, of course they are also are old hands. Um, but like any uh, two different uh, individuals, their personalities are different. Um, so I don't think that the, um, the central policy um, and the whole policy of one country system has changed, but because of the difference in personalities, they may bring um, a, a kind of new style, perhaps, um, in the interaction with uh, the people of Hong Kong and with the Hong Kong government. But, but even uh, with the dis difference in personalities, I think the same policies will, uh, will, will continue. But this does not, um, this the, does not address the whole um, uh, issues um, the, all the problems and challenges uh, that inform the Occupy movement and all these challenges um, largely remain. Although the situation is slightly different now, I think that we are seeing some improvement uh, in the mood. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons why uh, what led to the Occupy movement uh, was um, a lot of the, the youngsters, the, the university students uh, and some uh, parts of the younger uh, generation in Hong Kong uh, do not identify themselves as um, uh, Chinese. I mean, the first of all, they identify themselves as Hong Kong people. Uh, and of course, because of all these social problems, um, the housing, um, uh, social mobility, uh, and the perceived um, 
um, as a lack of attention of the government to some of their um, the problems of the population um, and, and the perception that the Hong Kong government is too much uh, bending itself towards the wills of Beijing rather than listening to, to them. Uh, all these problems still remain. But we see that after the, in recent months, um, the mood has si slightly improved, um, not because of these change of personalities, but because of a number of uh, events. Mm -hmm. uh, first, firstly, yes. um, the um, disqualification of some legislators, and I think we can talk about this uh, later on, because yes, these yes, actually are very, very significant. Yes, you yeah. have actually mentioned uh, some very important uh, points here. First of all, one of the most important root causes of why the central Occupy Central movement broke out in the first place. Henry, uh, concerning what Andrew was talking about, for instance, the fact that many young Hong Kong people do not identify themselves as Chinese, but rather Hong Kong people, and uh, their uh, grudges or their dissatisfaction with the, uh, the Hong Kong government uh, in the so-called bending too much towards the Beijing uh, policy or Beijing idea. Uh, what is your take on this issue? Do you think three years on, uh, such problem has been uh, solved a little bit or has kind of stayed over the, over the course of time? I think the uh, Occupation Central movement, I think uh, it reflects the, the, the difference between the people of Hong Kong and the mainland towards the concept of democracy and and I think it is unfortunate that it also is a watershed of the Hong Kong political landscape where uh, democratic movement you know, has become a separatist movement, at least some, some of some politicians. So I think it needs time to really heal the damage. And um, I think what we could do, uh, uh, as the presidency has mentioned, uh, we should promote the basic law to, to people, in particular the young people, and also uh, in, encourage young people in Hong Kong to visit mainland China and to understand more about our country's latest development. Mm -hmm. uh, but how, how has the political climate in Hong Kong changed over the past three years, Henry? I mean, uh, you also worked in the SAR government in the past and you are the convener of One Country, Two Systems Forum. Have you noticed some kind of shift since the Occupy Central movement ended three years ago? Uh, well, I think in Hong Kong, most people, they support one country, two systems. I think there's only a very handful of people, uh, mainly some young people, uh, they may think about you know, whether separatists or even independence may work for Hong Kong, but I think most of us would realize that uh, it is a no-go issue, it is, it is not feasible, and, and, uh, and one country, two systems is the best arrangement for Hong Kong even after 2047. I think that's the consensus of most Hong Kong people. Mm -hmm. Andrew, now you were talking about uh, some positive changes or some positive developments uh, uh, which have been happening over the past few months. Uh, tell us a bit more about on that front. Well, if you look at the occupied movement uh, in the beginning, um, it wasn't a movement um, for separatism. It was a movement um, uh, for greater, um, for, for this um, electoral reform. Mm -hmm. Because um, that re electoral reform triggered uh, this kind of division in the society. Now, there are parts of the um, uh, society who feel that uh, the basic law doesn't give them the, the kind of democracy they want. Um, for example, the, um, under the, uh, the basic law, um, the, the, um, the, the few, uh, in fact, it, it was Beijing who promised the, uh, the Hong Kong people um, um, electoral reform and electing the future chief executive by one, ma one man, one vote. Now, that um, uh, is not, was not um, a, a requirement uh, under the joint declaration between China and Britain. Uh, it was uh, Beijing's initiative to introduce in this in the basic law. But this initiative is, is not appreciated by some sectors of the community. They feel that uh, there are some, all these safeguards in the basic law requiring the uh, nomination of candidates by committee uh, does not square with democratic principles. So they refuse to accept uh, the final offer, um, but without realizing that this under one country, two systems, uh, is a contradiction in terms, um, according to some observers, mm -hmm. because um, there are, you know, 95% uh, of the provisions in the basic law are to guarantee the two systems, but there are a few guarantees 
for the one country. Now these direct guarantees may not be democratic, but that was the deal between Beijing and Hong Kong. And, and a lot of the, people, uh, the young people did not accept that. Um, but without understanding that without the one country, there could be no two systems. So I think that this contradiction is coming to the fore. And then after the Occupy movement, um, because the, the cost of taking part in the political uh, move, uh, uh, of taking part in the Occupy Central uh, was not very high. For example, a lot of the people arrested were giving very short sentences at the beginning. Uh, some were giving community service, uh, and, and 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 the top ring leaders were not charged until recently. This has changed. For example. Um, First, uh, firstly, um, the, 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 the kind of sep um, a separatist um, movement, uh, in so-called independence movement, uh, is gaining some traction um, and then um, resulted in some sort of uh, newly elected legislators uh, violating their, their oath-taking. As a result, um, um, a, a, a few have been disqualified. Now this qualification, is, this qualification is important in the sense that a lot of the power of the uh, democratic camp rests in controlling um, uh, over one-third of the votes. And uh, by controlling one-third of the votes in the legislature, they are in a position to block a lot of the proposals um, in the Legislative Council, mm -hmm. so giving them political power. But uh, after the disqualification, then their, their, uh, their one, th one third kind of um, uh, uh, control is lost. Uh, secondly, uh, some of the ring leaders are, are now being charged, are still being uh, yes. tried. Uh, but uh, for example, some of the, 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 the leaders were resentenced uh, to prison terms. So the youngsters are uh, beginning to realize that there is a a huge cost uh, in, in, in disrupting the law, uh, in violating the law, yes. to express their opinion. Andrew, yes. So I think that there is a, a, a realization that this um, uh, has a moderating influence uh, on, the, uh, on, on, on the kind of movement, of the student movement. Yes, very much so. You mentioned the, uh, the sentencing of some youngsters. Indeed, the high, <coughs> excuse me, the high Court of Hong Kong has eventually sentenced some student activists, including Joshua Wan, Alex Cho, and Nathan Law, to six, seven, and eight months in prison, respectively. Um, Henry, despite, <coughs> how do you look at the, um, the lightness or the, uh, the heaviness of mm. the punishment? Because some opposition still claims that the rule of, rule of law in Hong Kong is, is dead. What is your take after hearing the verdict? Well, I think at the beginning, uh, these gentlemen received a non-custodial <coughs> sentences, and then the Secretary of Justice uh, applied for a review of the sentence uh, to the High Court. Um, I think these are all according to the established procedures, and I don't think there's a problem for rule of law. Uh, I, I saw the judgment you know, of the High Court judges, and they laid out the criteria uh, for which this, uh, this sentence uh, is based and also the definition of violence and why uh, the judges uh, think that it is appropriate to to have a, have a custodial sentence. So I think the rule of law in Hong Kong is still remaining uh, pretty well and um, I don't think we should really judge you know, whether there's a rule of law or independent judiciary just based on one cases or, or based on one judgment. Meanwhile, there is also the question of the other so-called co-founders of the Occupy movement. For instance, a petition to oust co-founder Benny Tai from his uh, university post attracted 80,000 signatures. Uh, Pro-government legislator Eunius uh, Ho Kwon Yeo organized the online petition last week. Now, Tai, together with the um, two other co-founders of the movement, have yet to be sentenced for their role in instigating the protest. Um, Harry, uh, why has the process taken so long? Has it taken too long? Well, um, uh, according to the government, uh, they are, they are uh, reviewing the evidence and then they lay the charges after that review was completed. Um, I agree that it has, been, it has taken a bit long, but what's more important is that uh, because the trial is coming very soon, and I hope that uh, the justice will be seen and, and these, uh, these uh, organizers, they, they should take the legal responsibility because they, they claim that at the outset that, uh, that they would accept any legal consequences of their actions, what they called 
civil disobedience. But of course, I, of course, I think that's an erroneous use of this, because for three years ago during the movement, we are not talking about a repression of political system. We are talking about a move towards universal suffrage. We are talking about the degree of democratic progress. So I think the concept of civil disobedience is just totally ungrounded. And but that justified some people, including young people, for the violation of law. And I think that's quite unfortunate. Well, we are going to take a short break, and you have been watching the point with Mu Liuxin. We'll be back right after this and continue talking about the um, important issues surrounding Hong Kong. Stay with us. Welcome back, and we are talking about the three-year anniversary of the start of the Occupy Central movement in Hong Kong with uh, Andrew Long joining us from Hong Kong and Henry Ho here in the Beijing studio. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about what has been happening on the campuses of some Hong Kong universities most recently. We've seen uh, banners advocating Hong Kong independence popping up, and there is fierce exchanges of rhetoric on both sides of the camp supporting or opposing such idea. Andrew, how has this kind of uh, call for uh, Hong Kong independence become even more heated on the campus of Hong Kong after three years after the Occupy Central movement? Well, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, during the Occupy movement, although there were some uh, minor posters referring to self-determination, that was not the main thing. But now on the campuses, uh, it seems that the, uh, this is becoming a hot topic, and the students are putting up uh, banners, uh, and the, uh, univers some of the university lecturers uh, are pointing out of, um, uh, the importance of of uh, freedom of speech and freedom of discussion uh, in, um, um, in, in academia. Um, I think if it, a lot of the Hong Kong people, they do not buy this kind of independence. Um, in the early days, before, bef even before the Occupy movement, there was one time when I was on the university campus and, and one of the legislators, um, Emily Lau, who was a, a democratic um, legislator, one of the, the chief um, um, uh, protagonists, as it were, but she was surrounded by 2,000 Hong Kong youth students, and the Hong Kong youth students were asking her, you know, so for her method of uh, promoting democracy um, was, was no use. I mean, it was no, too soft. Um, so the students want more uh, aggressive action. Um, so uh, after that, I, I talked to the students. I asked them, well, what do you want? Do you want to start a revolution? Then to my surprise, the students said yes. And I said, well, do you think that the revolution will be successful? And they said, well, they don't care. Well, they said, look at the Qing dynasty. Well, you see how misinformed they are. And in the sense that the Hong Kong has uh, returned to the motherland, uh, but the hearts and minds uh, of uh, some parts of the younger generation, uh, they have not returned to the motherland in the, fact, in the sense that um, when they were born, uh, Hong Kong has already returned to um, to China, um, and, and, and a lot of the students, they did not study history, uh, they study economics, they study law, mm -hmm. they study medicine, they study accountancy, so they don't understand the, the, the kind of um, history, um, apart from the, um, uh, the history yeah. of China, uh, the history of Hong Kong, so I think that this uh, disconnect somewhere. Yeah, that, and this that disconnect needs to be addressed. Sure, that's kind of uh, irony, isn't it? I mean, for these young people to be born after the return of Hong Kong, they have actually become so uh, disconnected with, with reality. Mm. Uh, Henry, you work with young people, right? You convene the uh, One Country, Two Systems Youth Forum. Uh, what is your observation? Uh, where's the way forward? Well, actually, I have a slightly different point of view. Uh, well, we we saw some posters, some irritating posters in the university, but if you look back in the past two years, I think the, the concept or the idea of independence, it, it was you know, kind of grown in the Hong Kong U, and then go to the streets, and then very recently some legislative councillors uh, 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 were separatists. But following the, the disqualification of some uh, councillors, the interpretation of basic law, I saw a retreat actually from these kind of forces from, the, from our legislative council back to the streets, back to the campus. So while I think we should condemn these kind of uh, posters as we do not support independence, uh, we do not need to pay too much apprehension about this because all in all it's just some posters sticking in one, board, one, uh, in one or two universities. And I think it's important that we 
we engage a dialogue with young people. Yeah. And well, exactly how to address the underlying uh, conflict that have been reflected by you know these posters. What what is missing here? What needs to be done, especially concerning young people, Henry? I think uh, with the rise of uh, internet and also social media, I think there are pros and cons for that. To me, I think uh, many young people they rely the information from from the social media, and some of them may be pretty biased, and and they would like to, they they may tend to magnify you know the problems of of our country, mainly China, and and I think they should uh, they should really visit mainly China uh, more and to understand the development of our country. I noticed one data which is that uh, I think about one million Hong Kong people they do not have a home return permits and many of them are young people so so I think it's important to to promote our national education and let more young people know actually their development potential may lie with the mainland Mm -hmm. Andrew, uh, I think this is a very important point that Henry just made here and I think it's also one of the most important messages uh, President Xi Jinping uh, delivered when he was addressing Hong Kong during the 20th anniversary celebration. He said there will be greater facilitation of a convenience for Hong Kong people to travel to uh, the mainland and see the country, see its development for their own eyes. Uh, do you th how, what do you think of the importance of this? And you know whether there are other important things need to be urgently done. Well, the younger generation, so-called the um, uh, the I generation. I mean, they were born with the internet, with social media, and so on and so forth. Um, they are unlikely to accept uh, being educated. <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, is looking at textbooks and telling what them what to think. The more important is the opportunities. Um, as, as President Xi uh, highlighted during his um, speech uh, in Hong Kong, um, of offering them opportunities to take part in, for example, projects in, uh, on the mainland. Um, there are uh, projects which could appeal to their aspirations, uh, such as projects for um, environment, um, the projects for, for poverty relief, um, and of course even um, opportunities um, or, 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 or internships um, uh, uh, on the one bell one road um, kind of uh, projects. Now these opportunities are, opportunities are important to them because when they apply to uh, elitist universities either in China or uh, in America or in Europe uh, this could improve their credentials um, and through the involvement in these projects then gradually they will see um, uh, in, in, uh, as this country, uh, China is rising, there are opportunities as well as there are challenges, um, and they, they can be become part of that. Uh, now, I'm not saying that um, um, uh, national education is not important. What I'm just saying is, uh, is not um, uh, we can't rely on that too much uh, with the aspirations of this um, uh, the younger generation. More important uh, is the is the uh, availability of opportunities to attract um, them to get them involved. Um, in uh, what's going on uh, inside China and also as China embraces the world and how Hong Kong sees itself uh, as part of this whole process. Um, the, um, the paradox is that um, the one country, two systems is unique and there are safeguards for the, for the one country as well as safeguards for the two systems. But if you keep on challenge, challenging uh, the safeguard to the one country, the flexibility of the two systems will be that more constrained. Conversely, mm -hmm. if we build trust uh, with the one, one country, if we build trust with Beijing, there could be more flexibility for the two systems. Now, another point that informs yes. the aspirations of the young people is that um, for us uh, uh, old timers, we don't know where we, we would be by the year 2047. Uh, when the one country, two system formula is supposed to expire. But for the young people, they, they are asking um, um, uh, the question, you know, what, what's going to happen? So without a definitive answer, um, they say, well, in which case we'll take our future in our own hands. Yeah. So and somehow uh, in, the, in the coming years, uh, there need to be mutual trust. And there was a sufficient trust. Uh, that's a question sure. uh, about the, the, the continuing future beyond 2007 yeah. uh, when it's made clear that would we'll take away this kind of worry for the young people. Of Andrew, Hong Kong. yeah, uh, let me ask uh, Henry's take here. Uh, first of all, will the one country, two systems expire? Um, what is your belief here? What is your uh, understanding here, Henry? Uh, well, uh, according to the basic law, the, the original you know, capitalist system will remain for 50 years, but uh, 
I don't think uh, Hong Kong will become socialist or the same system with mainland China. But I think what's more important is that we have mutual trust between mainland and, and Hong Kong because I think it's still, still 30 years from now. And I want to uh, make two points about President Xi Jinping's speech as well. Um, the first thing is I welcome the, the measures to facilitate the convenience of Hong Kong people working and studying in mainland China. Actually, my think tank, I'm conducting a study on Hong Kong people working and studying in, in mainland, mm -hmm. including a survey in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, and it will be released pretty soon. And the second point is uh, I noticed that president, the president said that um, uh, the central government is willing to engage dialogue with people from different political stands as long as they support one country two systems. And I saw it as a, I see it as a positive sign to our like pan-democratic camps and those people who are maybe very critical to Hong Kong government or central government, but most of them uh, are supporting one country two systems. So, so I think the, the situation is, is getting it's getting better mm -hmm. from my point of view. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think President Xi made a very, in, a very important point there. He says the central government will seek maximum common ground while allowing maximum differences to exist, right? And I think that is a very clear message. So uh, we have to go there. Thank you very much, Henry Ho, convening, convener of the One Country, Two Systems Youth Forum and in Hong Kong, and Julon, an independent and in international China strategies. Uh, very quick, uh, personal point here uh, under the instigation of radicalists. The young people of Hong Kong, especially on university campuses, have become more enthusiastic today about uh, uh, politics than three years ago. But rational debate within the framework of law is the only constructive way forward and a cultural revolution is not the answer to the problems facing Hong Kong. That's all for this edition of The Point with me, Li Xin. As always, you can follow us on Twitter or visit our Facebook page using the handle the uh, point with Alex. Download the application for CGTN Live to watch our show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got the point. <laughs>